Okay. So, uh, good evening, everyone, once again. And uh, so, today's topic, which is being given to me, is uh, ADHD versus hyperactivity. So, the basic uh, take home message what we'll be learning from this session is, uh, is every hyperactive child will be labeled as an ADHD kid. And what are the features of true ADHD? And how we can differentiate ADHD from hyperactivity? And what are the various reasons of hyperactivity that may mimic the picture of ADHD, which may not be actually a true ADHD? So that is the whole purpose of today's discussion. And we'll be basically discussing and going in detail about the ADHD. So uh, uh, there are approximately 80 slides, but I'll try to skip them because it will not be possible to cover all of them in uh, the stipulated time, which is given to me of one and a half hours. So I'll start with the presentation. So what is ADHD basically? So ADHD, we all know that it stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactive Disorder. And it is a condition of the brain that makes it difficult for the children to inhibit their spontaneous responses, which includes everything from movement to speech and attentiveness. So the inhibitory responses are at very minimal, whereas the excitatory responses are very, very high. So all these children struggle to pay attention, sit still or listen and follow directions. So this is very common for every age group, especially related when we are talking about toddlers, when we are talking about the age group early children, or we might be talking about the middle age group of the children, maybe around toddlers two to three or maybe four to six years. So this is very common in every child. But do we label them as an ADHD? No. So what are those differences that we need to understand? So, however, when we talk about children with ADHD, these kinds of behaviors like inattentiveness, impulsiveness, hyperactivity are so frequent and severe that they interfere with the ability to function or day to day learn. So here we need to intervene that, yes, it's a uh, problem which is basically affecting the learning and academics of the children in day to day routine activity. So there are certain facts of about ADHD. ADHD, we know it is the most common childhood neurodevelopmental condition or disorder. And according to the Indian statistics, it is about three to five out of every hundred children have some form of ADHD. These stats, I have taken it from probably around 2014 and probably the stats might have changed after the COVID, probably. So it all occurs. So there are there is no racial discrimination. It occurs in all races, social economic status. And we know that it is four times more common among boys than girls. The ratio is similar to that of the ASD also. So ADHD is a neurodivergent way of being. Now, th this is a contradictory statement which I'm making. At one point of time, I'm saying ADHD is the most common neurodevelopmental disorder. Whereas on the other fact, I'm saying that ADHD is a neurodivergent condition or a neurodivergent way of being and listening, understanding and perceiving the world. So nowadays, there is a concept of neurodiverse or neurodiversity where we say that ADHD, autism, dyslexia, SLD, speech language, these are all normal variants of the developing brain. So they are considered to be as neurodiverse or neurodiversity or neurodiverse uh, conditions, which are actually not a neurodevelopmental disorders, but they are considered to be the variants of the normal developing brain. So this is our thought process, which is now being involving and changing. And we need to understand that these are now no more considered to be as a neurodevelopmental conditions, though it is still written in our textbooks. And uh, this is how we learn these definitions as of now today. But it's high time that we need to think over it beyond. So it's commonly diagnosed in childhood and carries into an adult world. With proper support and the right interventions, individuals can learn to deal with nearly all forms of ADHD symptoms and can lead an independent adult life. So how does a child of ADHD look like? We know that these are some of the common pictures like inattentiveness, hyperactivity, and impulsive. They are very, very impulsive. They find it very, very difficult to wait for the turns. They might push. They might not stand in a straight line. Inattentiveness, they lose their attentions very uh, easily. They trouble focusing on attention, concentrating on the task. They are able to find it very, very difficult to do the minute activities, minute tasks, which may often make a lot of you know silly mistakes because of their fidgetility, restlessness, and hyperactivity. So all these features, we all know that these are the common features of an ADHD child. So how to differentiate a normal behavior? As I've discussed in my previous slide, these all these things do present in a child who is coming from this uh, toddler age group or who is very much pampered. So can we label them as an ADHD or as a normal behavior or it's a notorious child or is it too pampered child? So those things we need to look upon. And even if the child is having a lot of screen time, it might give you a picture of a pseudo ADHD, though it might not come as to a true ADHD. 
because when we talk about the term virtual autism in virtual autism most of the picture comes mimicked as an adhd picture but it doesn't come out to be a true adhd that is very very important when we are taking the history in relation to these adhd symptoms so it's normal for children to be distracted restlessness impatient impulsive these things don't always mean that a child is adhd that's exactly what i was telling so we need to look into a deep, deeper close look that what are the signs of hyperactive impulsivity and attention so a lot of times signs of adhd are observed and reported by the school as issues in self control distractive and attentive behavior so pay close attention to all such feedbacks given by the teachers because many a times it is a very very big problem that acceptance doesn't come easily unless and until it is being provoked unless and until it is being given an attention by the school teachers or some care or some other uh, teachers who are looking after the child after the uh, other than the parents or the caregivers so normal behavior versus adhd are noticeably greater than is expected for children age or development level were present when the child was very young usually before the age of 7 this is when we talk about the normal behavior present themselves across different variants and situations impacts their functioning like relationship with peers family members and different settings so this is very very important when we talk about adhd adhd settings is very very important that these behaviors of hyperactivity impulsivity will not depend upon the environment will not depend upon the situation will not depend upon the person they will be present in all the different environments whether it is home school whether it is therapy centers whether it is uncle auntie and these will not be influenced by any environment or person so they must be present in two or more settings as per the dsm 5 criteria will be going to the details because many a time we say that ye bachcha is very very hyperactive he doesn't listen to mama but he listens to papa he is very very hyperactive in school run here and there but he he doesn't show any signs is very cooperative in doing tasks at home but those doesn't mean that he an adhd it might be he is a, a hyperactive child it might be due to x y z reasons which we need to discuss in the further slides so now this is a very very important slide which i have prepared so whenever we talk about hyperactivity or inattentiveness it always doesn't mean that the child is on an adhd spectrum we need to look out why the child is hyperactive and inattentive so just given just give a thought process before putting a child on an adhd just rule out all these problems of hyperactive inattention and attention which might happen in a child first and foremost it could be as a result hyperactivity could be because of proprioceptive issues tactile vestibular sensory or overload sensory meltdowns a child might be a spd a sensory processing so he might not be comfortable with the he might not be comfortable with the textures he might not be comfortable with the touch he might always be running in air he might be always uh, might be a vestibular seeker so it might be very very difficult for him to sit in a class as a result because he is a vestibular seeker he always want to want to go he always want to run here and there he might not be comfortable in talking he might not be comfortable because of the speech and language delay so there might be an issues where he is not able to express things as a result he might start showing attention seeking behavior so behavior problems like attention seeking escape or avoidance tangible behavior these things might generally happen when the child is poor on his receptive and expressive language if not on receptive might be an expressive if it is both to need to look into the features is the child is having a speech language delay is it having an autism spectrum disorder because many a times child adhd co morbid with autism and many a times we get a picture with adhd with autism or autism with adhd as a result of this the the phenotype of autism is so uh, the phenotype of autism is so dominant that it undermines the phenotype of any adhd as a result we miss that actually it is a true adhd or this picture is coming as a result of sensory processing disorders or as a result of the spectrum of autism as such then you need to look into the reasons of inattentiveness the child might be having an auditory processing issues uh, he might be having a poor receptive skills or in spite of having a good receptive skills he might be having auditory processing issues as a result he might not be able to follow your command on a single go you might be requiring uh, prompts either it may be a visual or it may be a verbal or it may be a gestural prompts so all those things need to look into attention many a times what happens a child is playing with his toys and mama gives him a command go to the kitchen and get some glass he won't respond to it at all sometimes mother shouts he raises a voice he might respond to that so it doesn't mean that the child is having an inattention and we might put it under the category of adhd it might be an attention because he might be having an auditory issues it might be an attention because he is having a poor receptive speech poor receptive understanding so all those things we need to look 
when we talk about medical issues, adenoid hypertrophy is a very common uh, association of uh, problems, allergic problems when we talk about children on autism spectrum or ADHD. In large tonsils, that might be disturbing his sleep. He might not be that much expressive. There might be speech language issues. There might be X, Y, Z reasons. He might be a delay on his, uh, he might be a late talker. So whatever the reasons might be, he might not be able to express. So he might get irritated. He might get hyperactive. He might get inattentive. He might start showing behaviors. There might be gut issues, seizure problems. So all those things need to look at into out what is the reasons for his hyperactive and inattentiveness before labeling a child and putting on a spectrum of ADHD. So pattern recognition, the art of making an informed diagnosis is very, very important when we come into the diagnosis of an ADHD. So ADHD, we need to look into the phenotypes, whether it is an inattentive, hyperactive, and the behavioral patterns which I have discussed in the previous slide. So they can be the, uh, broadly, we, uh, we classify behaviors. The causes of behaviors are either tangible, either attention seeking, either medical or sensory, which we have discussed in the previous slides. So we need to look into those behavior patterns before putting a child under the spectrum of ADHD. So now let's discuss about some of the strengths of autistic individuals. Why I'm putting this slides? Because many a times, as I've told you, ADHD picture correlates with the, uh, you know, combines with an uh, autistic picture, combines with an ADHD. And there it becomes very, very difficult to differentiate whether it is a true picture of autism, whether it is a true picture of ADHD, or it is a mem or it is uh, a co uh, combination of autism and ADHD. So strengths of autistic individuals, we know that they have musical abilities as uh, what we know as Asperger syndrome or high functioning. They might be enhanced perception to visual and auditory. They might be ability to process large amounts of information, patterns. They may have uh, ability to form typical patterns. Then. They have a difficulty in reliability instead of insisting on the sameness. That is what we call fixations, restricted interest, stereotypic patterns. So all these things are considered to be the strengths. Now, we don't take it them as strengths. We, in fact, take it them as negative behaviors like restricted interest, stereotypic factors. They are very obsessed. They, are very, they have very fixations. But instead of them, we can use them as their strong you know, interest areas. We can use them as their strong strengths. If they have so much fixations, if they are focused that this thing has to be kept in this matter, we can utilize their focus. Uh, one thing that is very important, in fact, autistic children or children or ADHD, they are actually very, very hyper-focused. In the sense, because of the restricted interest, because of the uh, obsession, because of the fixations. If we utilize them in the right direction, if we utilize them in an area of interest, it is the best possible strength these children can have. So red flag signs of autism, social communication, limited use of gestures, use another person's hand as a tool that is called as a hand lending, delayed speech, unusual tone of voice, difficulty in maintaining eye contact, gestures, and pretending or poor imitations, imit uh, imitatory play or not pretending or that is poor pretend play. Social communication issues, we know that conversational skills, inferential skills, reading non-verbal cues, turn taking, facial expressions, adjusting speech to different people, Initiation of speech, maintenance of speech, reading the emotions of others, what we know as facial cues, understanding the humors and emotional understanding is very, very difficult for them. Social interactions we have discussed, that is eye contact is poor, joint attention is poor, reciprocity is poor, that I think we have discussed in our previous webinar on socialization skills. This I have just shown you to make understand that for social interaction, these are some of the prerequisites which are very, very important, which are deficit in these children on neurodivergent spectrum. So repetitive behavior and restricted interest, unusual ways of moving their hands, develops rituals as lining up objects or repeating things over and over. They are very focused or unattached to unusual kinds of objects, excessive interest in particular objects, actions and activities, and unusual sensory interest, like they might be playing with the shadows, they might be playing with the, you know, uh, uh, shadows, they might be playing with the rotating things, they might be very uh, happy to uh, listen to the sounds of utensils when they throw on the floor. So these are some of their unusual interests which they have, which we uh, include under re restricted repetitive behaviors or known as stimming. So why do we need to know these co-occurrence of ADHD with autism? This is very, very important. One question would come that we are discussing about ADHD, why these slides of autism are there? This is the main purpose why we need to discuss that, because as ADHD diagnosis can delay the diagnosis of NASD, it is very, very important. An ADHD diagnosis can delay the diagnosis of NASD and treating an ADHD 
when it is comorbid can improve the outcomes of ASD intervention and severity of comorbid ADHD is correlated to the increased parental stress. This is very, very important. And uh, because when we are working on ADHD and when we are working on ASD, the approach towards both of the interventions is different. But when you are treating ADHD, when it is associated with ASD, definitely your interventions for ASD will become less and the results will be much, much better. So it is very, very important to differentiate that we should not never miss a diagnosis of any ADHD with an ASD. So it is very important because the approach for ADHD versus ASD is different. We need to do a behavioral management and accordingly, we need to look into the ASD interventions, how we need to cope up because we might be going towards the directions of ASD interventions, but those behaviors, those inattentiveness, those hyperactivities might be as a result of an ADHD. The reason why I'm telling because as we know that hyperactivity, inattentiveness is also a common phenotype of ASD. But every child on ASD has inattentiveness, hyperactivity, behavioral concerns. But that doesn't mean that all ASD kids are ADHD. And said that it doesn't mean that all ADHD kids are ASD. So this is, is very, very important to differentiate that co-occurrence of ADHD with autism. So another important thing is, as I've told, why it is important to distinguish between ASD from autism. This is because many a times if you see that ADHD and autism picture more or less mimics same. In ADHD also, we will might be getting a lot of sensory issues. They might be a typical sometimes passion. Emotional dysregulations might be there. They might be difficulty in communications. They might be difficulty in understanding the facial cues also. But on the contrary, the one thing is they won't be having a typical repetitive stereotypic patterns or sensory uh, what we call stimming. Though they might be having sensory issues, but they won't be having a typical stereotypic repetitive patterns which we typically get in autism. So these are some of the differentiating features which help us to differentiate between the two. But said that, instead of that, there are a lot of picture which overlaps between ADHD and autism. Most important is sensory issues, hyperactivity, inattentiveness, focus, social communication. So uh, uh, then uh, uh, interaction in the social scenarios, rejection, social interest, passions. So all these things, difficulty in maintaining eye contact. All the, now, difficulty in maintaining eye contact between ADHD and autism. In ADHD, the difficulty in maintaining eye contact is more of because of the anxiety, more of because of the inattentiveness. Difficulty in responding to the face, uh, you know, responding, the receptive language is poor even in ADHD and autism. But between autism and ADHD, the difference between the two is the reason for receptive language poor in ADHD is because of the poor inattentiveness and hyperactivity. Whereas in autism, the reason is not of inattentiveness and hyperactivity is more of because it might be a low IQ or it might be due to X, Y, Z other reasons which are not typical of ADHD. So autism is characterized by difficulties with neurotypical social, uh, neurotypical social interaction, communication and tendency to self-regulate through repetitive and routine. Uh, routine. So they have special interests and restricted stereotypic patterns. Autism is the fastest growing neurodevelopmental condition and prevalence is around 2.8%. So ADHD is characterized difficulty in regulating attention and difficulty with hyperactive impulsivity. And ADHD is estimated to be a prevalence of 5 into 11. Now, one thing is very, very important. In both of them, ADHD and autism, both of them are having hyperactivity. Both of them are having emotional dysregulation. Now, in ASD, the emotional dysregulation which is happening, it is happening due to the external environment. An ASD child will have an emotional dysregulation whenever he is being exposed to an XYZ environment. Whereas an ADHD kid is having an emotional dysregulation which is internal, which is something which is his internal genotype. Or I won't use the word exactly genotype because genotype is something which cannot be corrected. So it's basically an internal state of the body which is having an uh, emotional dysregulation. Whereas when we talk about NASD, ASD child will have an emotional dysregulation which is subjected to the environment. In some, he might behave uh, properly. In, in some, he might not be able to regulate his emotions. Whereas an ADHD kid will, will have emotional dysregulation in most of the environment. So it is not environment restricted. It is not environment influenced. Whereas in ASD, it is environment influenced. So why is it important to distinguish? We have discussed autism and ADHD co-occur at higher rates. When a person is autistic, they have a higher rate of being ADHD and vice versa. So similarly, autism and ADHD co-occur within families at higher rates and share a great deal of genetic and neurobiological overlap. So if you just go into the slides, as I mentioned, is that around 
22 to 80 percent of children also meet the criteria for ADHD. So the percentage is so variant that 20 to 80 percent. So said that it doesn't mean the rates are very, very high. It is so much fluctuating that you cannot always assure that an autism is co-occurring with ADHD or an ADHD is co-occurring with autism because the spectrum is such that. That is why we use the word autism spectrum and ADHD spectrum. So it is very, very important to differentiate those hyperactivity and inattentiveness of an autistic phenotype, whether they are due to and true ADHD or it is due to an actual picture of autism. So the research surrounding the overlap between ADHD and autism is relatively new. Until recently, until the DSM-5 was updated in 2013, these two conditions could not be simultaneously diagnosed. Until the DSM-5, a diagnosis of autism prelude diagnosed ADHD and vice versa. So this is again an important update that as per the DSM-4, we were not able to make a com uh, comorbid or overlapping diagnosis of ADHD and autism because in DSM-4, the criteria for autism and ADHD were totally different. There were no overlapping pictures. As a result, as per DSM-4, you were either able to make a diagnosis of NADHD or autism. The criteria, the, uh, the guidelines, the uh, criteria for uh, diagnosis of ADHD and, and uh, autism in DSM-4 was such that that the overlapping picture was not there. And you cannot make a comorbid, you cannot make an overlapping diagnosis with ADHD and autism in the same child. Whereas this uniqueness has now been come in DSM-5 where we are able to make a diagnosis of autism along with an ADHD picture if it fulfills the criteria of both as per DSM-5. So, however, the significance of this is that in the history of things, considering ADHD autism is relatively new. As per DSM-5, although the picture was always present before, but we were not able to make an overlapping diagnosis with the both. So, prevalence of overlap between autism and ADHD. So, what, what is the prevalence? What is the, What are the different studies which say that what is the prevalence rate of overlapping between autism and ADHD? So recent studies have demonstrated a significant phenotype presentation, genotype and neurobiological overlap between autism and ADHD. And several studies have shown that a prevalence rate of 20 to 80 percent autistic children also meet the diagnostic criteria of ADHD. You can see that how, how, uh, how uh, you know, how variation uh, is the percentage between the overlap of autism with ADHD. So it is very, very important again to differentiate uh, these two pictures. And similarly, 30 to 60 percent of children with ADHD have clinical significant levels of autistic traits. So genetic overlap between the two conditions, there is an approximately 50 to 70 percent overlap of contributing genetic factors. So uh, is, uh, studies have shown that there is approximately 50 to 70 percent genetic factors which contribute to both autism and ADHD. And according to the CDC, 14% of ADHD children are also autistic. So CDC says only 14% of ADHD children are autistic. But again, different studies had different uh, quotations. But overall, the spectrum is... The important thing is nowadays we don't much talk about genetics. We do talk about more of epigenetics. That is how your environment influences your genetic expressions. And this is exactly what... Epigenetic factors have now been contributed in overlapping the ADHD and autism picture. That is the effect of the environment, your effect of on the effect of expression of the genes and the gut microbiota. So when we talk about ASD versus autism, so these are now this is very, very important slide uh, from clinical point of view. So if a child comes to you, what picture will give you a more picture which is likely to be an ASD and what picture will give you which is more likely to be an ADHD? So when we talk about so considering these three important parameters, social reciprocity, non-verbal communication and eye contact. Now, all these three parameters are affected in autism as well as in ADHD. So how will you differentiate whether it is a picture is falling more in the spectrum of autism or more in the spectrum of ADHD? Suppose we take the parameter of social reciprocity, typical response when attentive. So this is very, very important. As I've told you, ADHD child will give you a typical response when he's attentive. Whereas ASD inconsistent or poor response when being pulled upon. Because ADHD child is something where his, inter, where the where, where his internal state or attentiveness varies from environment to environment. And as a result, if the child is attentive, he will give you a good social, uh, social reciprocity or social response. Because there are no internal problems or there are no internal problems in communication. Wherein ASD child, there is a, always a poor response in social communication as we have discussed in the theory of motivation. There is no theory of motivation. There is no reward. There is no appreciation, internal appreciation. As a result, children on ASD do have definitely poor social reciprocity. Whereas ADHD child will respond good if it is attentive. 
in case of non verbal communication generally adhd kids they can read a good picture of facial expressions and gestures whereas in asd they have poor facial expressions poor gestural responses eye contact generally when we talk about adhd is typically good depending upon again if they are not attentive if they are impulsive if they are not uh, focused on their particular task when they are being called upon generally they will have a poor eye contact whereas when you talk about asd it is generally fleeting it is generally poorly regulated so these are more of a picture which will help you to differentiate now said that if you are making a child who is a 5 year old child come to your clinic and then you tell him okay how are you and he doesn't give you any response he just looks here and there you might feel that he is not responding to you but probably he is not giving an attention to you he is more attentive towards those high, uh, towards his areas of interest or he might be more interested in doing some other task so we need to look into other parameters like eye contact or non verbal communication can he read the facial cues and expressions and he might be very anxious when he's been exposed to a new environment so other things repetitive behaviors generally in adhd they are not very much present as we have discussed it is present and peer interaction uh, intact social understanding difficulty but peer interaction when we talk about in case of asd is generally very very poor because they are not able to understand the social understanding social interaction is very very poor in adhd they can have a good social understanding they can maintain that but provided if they are having a good attentive and attention and hyper uh, i mean impulsiveness is not there and if they are attentive so all those things need to be looked into consideration with, uh, to differentiate between the two now this is a screening tool for children between 4 to 11 years which we can use as an autism spectrum now generally we use uh, uh, m chat which is used only up to the age of 18 months to 2 years but this is one screening tool which we can use in the children uh, somewhere around 4 to 11 years so this is a very good quick screening tool which can give you an, it is a validated nhs screening tool which can give you a quick idea whether the child is falling into the spectrum or not so this is somewhere for the children who are presenting you at the age of 4 to 5 years now this is a screening tool for asd in the early adolescence 11 to 15 years when you are dealing with the children in the adolescence age group and you are suspecting to be an autistic child or autism or autistic adolescence so you can use this screening tool which will give you a clear idea so dsm now let's come on to the dsm 5 criteria for adhd when we call putting a child on the diagnosis of an adhd just give me a second please yeah so dsm 5 criteria so this is the latest criteria for adhd so to meet the criteria for adhd five buckets of diagnostic criteria must be met so there are five buckets from a to e the ones that we spend most of the time with are criteria a so now there are five criteria a a b c d e now the criteria a consists of two subcategories that is called inattentive inattention and hyperactivity now within each criteria there are nine symptoms so there are nine symptoms of inattention or which is and uh, there are nine symptoms of hyperactivity or what we call as impulsivity so for a diagnosis of adhd the person should meet six out of nine criteria for inattention and six out of nine criteria for hyperactivity or impulsivity the other criteria are largely used to differentiate adhd from other condition and other diagnosis so we need to look mainly into the criteria a but we will be going into the other criteria also so criteria a in attention and hyperactivity there are 9 out of these 6 out of 9 should be met so when we go into the adhd criteria a1 that is inattentive type so one of the critical components of our statement is that inattentiveness it must be consistent inconsistent with the developmental level meaning signal different than peers so that is very very important as i have told you every child will be inattentive but that is important that that inattentiveness should be different from that of his peers and his developmental level must impact his must impact his academic learning or his daily routine activities or his daily learning this is very very important to differentiate adhd from the routine inattentiveness or hyperactivity or tantrums so these are the signs of an inattention in this uh, diagram which i have shown you so these are nine criteria which are there out of these six should be met in the last six months difficulty with sustained attention difficulty difficulty in breaking large projection to smaller ones that is you might uh, he might not be able to uh, break down smaller task he might not be able to do color small these things 
losing objects frequently, forgetfulness, avoidance of tasks requiring sustained attention, might not be comfortable in coloring of complete picture, gets continuous distractions, overlooking details, is hyper focused, especially towards the particular areas, ray dreaming or lost in conversation sometimes, so appearing not to listen. So these are some of the features of ADHD where we give you an idea of inattentiveness. So six or more of the following symptoms have been persisted in the last six months to a degree that is inconsistent with the development level. This is very, very important. All these six out of nine criteria which I have mentioned should be inconsistent with the level or the developmental level of that child and they are different from the peers or they are different from the children of the same age group. And these types of problems should affect his daily learning. So these things should be to certain ex to such an extent that they affect his uh, academic learning day-to-day -day routine activities. So inattention versus ADHD, again, very important. Everyone has moments of inattention, distractibility, and difficulty with focus. So what distinguishes ADHD from situational struggle is that it is a part of the person's baseline experience and it is not situation dependent. It is present across multiple contexts. That is exactly what I told you. That and hyperactivity, which is present in autistic child, it is environmental variant. If the child might be hyperactive in a particular situation where there are a lot of sensory overload, sensory meltdown, like in a school. Whereas in a child which is present at home, he might be comfortable because there is no bell, there are no shouting, there is no teacher screaming, there is no 20 children talking or speaking. So there is no overload, sensory overload, there is no overwhelming response in a child. Whereas a child who is an ADHD, it is an internal state of inattention, distractively and showing behaviors. So that is not situational variant. So if a person only struggles in attention, focus, and it is a chaotic or a distracted mind, that, that isn't ADHD, that is situational inattention. That is exactly what I've told. If a person only struggles with inattention and focus when it is chaotic or distracting environment, that isn't ADHD. And that is the most common mistake that we make. Ki child school mein tikta nahi hai, wo idhar bhaagta rahata hai, wo udhar bhaagta rahata hai. But ghar mein wo thik hai. And we put it as a child as a ADHD. So it is basically a wrong diagnosis that you put a child on ADHD because ADHD is an internal state of, it is his internal, you know, uh, again, it's an internal epi, uh, genotype which makes it struggle in all the situations. It makes it hyperactive and attentive in all the situations, no matter whether it is a chaotic environment, whether it is a silent area or whether it is an uh, XYZ situation. So it is very important. It is not situational uh, dependent. When it is a situational dependent, we call it as a situational inattention and hyperactivity. Then we need to look into the causes of those. It might be an autistic trait which is affecting him or XYZ reasons. So these are the examples of inattention that is often loses keys, as I've told you, finds it very, very difficult to uh, do a lot of tasks which are very, very require minute activities, frequent mistakes, overlooks the minute things, difficulty in regulating attention and responding. And it's often being, you know, it uh, uh, gets lost in social communica uh, in communications, forgets activities a lot most of the times. So all these criteria are there. So to meet the criteria ADHD in attentive, a person must have six out of the nine criteria, as I was discussing you. And for the children, for children above 17 years, that is adolescence, five out of the following traits should be there. When we talk about children ADHD, six out of nine. When we talk about adolescence ADHD, we talk about five out of nine. So the second criteria, what we call as an hyperactivity or impulsivity, that is often fidgets with taps or hand squints. It's not able to wait for his turns, often leaves the seats, run here and there, is expected to be kept in a classroom as compared to his peers and everything. So often runs here and there, runs in appropriate situations, not able to control his, uh, you know, restlessness. So often unable to play or engage in leisure activities, not able to wait for his turn, often pushes others and runs away. So he's always on a go as uh, and often talks excessively, cannot wait for his turn. So uh, teacher always complain that if he knows the answer, responds immediately, he's not able to wait for his turn. So often has difficulty in turn taking, which is a very important thing. So all these criteria are nine. So out of these six out of nine, six criteria should be fulfilled in the last six months. Again, this is very, very important. These should be to such, such an extent that they're affecting his academic learning hampering his day-to-day -day routine activities and it is often very much different from the spectrum of hyperactivity and impulsivity that the peers of his age group are showing. So ADHD subtypes, let's talk about the ADHD subtypes. There are three different subtypes, ADHD inattentive, ADHD hyperactive impulsive and the combined type. So these are the three most common types which we discuss. 
So ADHD subtypes and I explained ADHD H is the most common subtype seen in the preschool. That is ADHD hyperactivity, which is the most, and this is very, very important for us. Whereas ADHD combined and independent are the most common ADHD seen in the adolescents and adults. That is why in adolescents and adults, the most common uh, sequelae of ADHD is anxiety. We might be able to control the hyperactivity. We might be able to control the inattentive, but anxiety is something which is the most common sequelae in ADHD adolescents. That is why combined and inattentive is the most common thing. Whereas ADHD H hyperactive is the most common, which is seen in the school age children or pre preschoolers. So a person who meet the criteria of different types of age might be through the different types. So this is in more in detail. We don't want to do so. The important thing is uh, in preschoolers and schoolers, ADHD H hyperactive is most common. Adolescents I is the most common and combined. So to summarize, explain about the summarize that ADHD subtypes for diagnosis, six out of nine subcategories of inattention and hyperactivity should be met. For children above 17 years, five out of nine should be met. Similarly, for uh, inattentive, hyperactive, and combined is not very important for us when we are talking about the preschoolers and uh, pediatric age group. Then you come out to be the criteria B2E that is often neglected and missed out. Now, these criteria are not very important, but they have been labeled, they have been put in the DSM-5. Criteria B, C, D, E. Now, criteria B is ADHD is a neurodevelopmental condition with a neurodivergent. It is innate and not acquired, and it must be evidenced of throughout the life. So, before the age group of 12 years, this is very, very important. These symptoms should be preferred before the age of 12 years. Criteria C may contribute to ADHD, I that is inattentive, impulsive and hyperactive, which are often missed often. An emerging research suggests that impact on functioning, that is impairment, has some differences among the different subtypes. While ADHD C often shows impairment in both school and home and at work, and a subtype of people with I and H only show significant impairment in the single setting at a single point of time. So these are the different criteria which they have given, but when we talk about DSM-5 is generally going to the criteria of hyperactivity and inattentiveness met in the last six months with six out of nine criteria. So these are the additional criteria which have been put across in ADHD as per DSM-5. But to make a diagnosis of these, these additional criteria are not required. The criteria which are often required are, as I've told you, criteria A with inattentive and hyperactivity. Out of nine, six should be met each and in the last six months. So these are some of the facts uh, just uh, put across more likely to ADHD in attentive type, more likely to be undiagnosed, more likely to having occurring, more likely to be in the females, higher rate of internalization disorders, higher rates of learning disabilities, less likely to be treated with stimulants. We know that we have uh, CNS stimulants, non-CNS stimulants, and two to, time, uh, two to five times as likely to have a referral for speech and language problem. So these are the different studies which has been done in relation to inattentive type. So what are the ADHD comorbidities which are very, very important for us? Autism spectrum disorders, which we have discussed, learning disabilities, language disorders, sleep problems, anxiety, intellectual disability, mood disorders, and tick. Now, out of these, the two most important are for us is autism spectrum, learning disabilities, and language disorders. Because these three pictures often, uh, you know, combine and overlap with the ADHD picture, and that makes us a most, uh, most difficult problem whether to put the child on a language, because many a times why I'm talking is this, because a child might be labeled as a child might be on ADHD and he might not be able to communicate properly because of his inattention issues. He might not be able to uh, concentrate on proper activity. Other than this, he might be having a hyper focus of in his areas of interest. He might not be able to contract. He might not be able to communicate. He might not be able to communicate properly. So the child might be considered as a language deficit or as a language delay person. And we might put him into a language classes or language therapies. In fact, he might be requiring a behavioral therapy where we can manage on his behavioral and the concerns. So this is important that approach in making the correct diagnosis and associated comorbidities is very important because accordingly, our, uh, you know, track of early intervention will vary. So early AD, ADHD comorbidities we have discussed, and these are all uh, again sleep problems can exempt, uh, amplify the executive functioning or difficulties. 
Uh, regular uh, screening for sleep problems should be included as a component of ADHD. We know that sleep problems is a very, very big major issue in children with autism, uh, ADHD, even in autism. So sleep problems are very, very important and they can basically affect the executive functioning difficulties and executive functioning in children on ADHD as well as on autism. So uh, now then coming to the evaluation of the sleep issues. Now, many a times, uh, now this slide I have put across because many a times we get that, uh, we know that if, uh, uh, I don't know if the participants are dealing with the children's on autism spectrum or ADHD, they, you might get a lot of children who are having sleeping issues. And invariably, invariably, I believe that many of us might be starting on nocturnal, now, might be starting on mel uh, melatonin in a very low dose in order to, uh, I mean, regulate the sleep issues. But what is very, very important is this is as per the NICE guidelines, which has been taken for the management of sleep issues in autism and ADHD. The most important thing is whenever you are looking into the sleep issues of an ADHD and autism child, you need to look into the detailed history, 24 hour sleep diary pattern that how the child is behaving. Is he taking the day night slap? Is he taking the day night nap? Is he taking, is he having any uh, medical issues like adenoids, tonsils? What is his level of expression or speech? Is he able to express those things? So all those things you need to look into the consideration. Is he having gut issues? Is he having medical problems, adenoids? Is he having seizures? And then accordingly, is he having sensory issues? The sensory issues might be also a very big problem which might disturb the sleeping pattern of the child due to the texture, due to the brightness, due to the you know auditory input which the child is getting from the environment or even may the texture or the tactile issues. So all those things could be there, the brightness, the visuals. So these things need to be looked into consideration. So Bears has divided the sleep domains into different patterns. And these have been as per the mnemonic of Beard, that is bedtime problems, excessive daytime sleepness, waking during the night, regularity and duration of sleep, and SS snoring. So they have given you the uh, adolescence age group, school age group, and toddlers. So you need to look into the detailed history and take a detailed 24 diary of the sleep pattern of the child. And then accordingly, you need to figure it out that whether it is sensory, whether it is gut issues, whether it is adenoids problem, whether it is medical problems and X, Y, Z and accordingly you treat them. If in spite of that, you do not get the uh, uh, results on that, then at the last resort, you need to start on the melatonin. So this is very, very important. We should not start on the melatonin on the first step. You need to look into the root cause of the sleeping issues as per the bare sleep screening tool, which is a standardized tool and it is given as per the NICE guidelines. Then accordingly, you need to monitor them. I think we have discussed that general, uh, specific phobias, OCDs and ADHD comorbidities. I won't be going to the details of this. So let's come into the biological aspects of ADHD. So now what are the important causes of ADHD, how we can discuss. So biological aspects of ADHD will discuss etiology and neurological bias, uh, basis. Impact of functioning, how it can uh, affect his executive functioning, um, uh, then its impact across the lifespan. And biosocial aspects of ADHD where we play the interplay between the biological and environmental factors. This is exactly what I was talking about, the epigenetics. So if you go into these aspects, there is nothing now we call about genetics. It is more of an epigenetics. How your environment, how your environment, how your uh, personality, how your overall uh, surroundings, the vicinity affects the internal state of your body or affects the expression of the genes, what we call as uh, epigenetics. And this is now is a complete understanding of our, our neurodivergent conditions, including autism and ADHD. Why we say that? Because if it would have been genetics, there would have been no improvement in children on spectrum ADHD in spite of so much uh, early intervention therapies and medications. Because it is epigenetics, that is why we get the changes in the child and improvement in seeing the children who are in mild to moderate and even on the ADHD kids. We have also made a statement that most of the children on ADHD generally lead a normal independent lifespan as they reach into the adolescence because they get adapted to the environment. If it would have been purely genetic, no matter whatever intervention you do, there would have been any correction at all. That is why our understanding towards them has now been changing from genetics towards epigenetics. So epigenetics is something where the corrections can be done and it is reversible at the level of the genes. So now comes into the etiology that is genetics, though we always mention about genetics, but yes, said that environmental epigenetics is more important. So these are some of the, I won't be going to the details of these genetics, 
then we got 12.5 percent of the recurrent risk in later born siblings or children diagnosed with adhd so this is a very important take home message that figures should be remembered whenever you are counseling a parents families or many times they come to you that we are planning for the second child our first child is on the neurodivergent spectrum so what are the recurrence risks what you should show so these are some of the figures which will help you in dealing during the counseling sessions in your clinical practice so 12.5 percent recurrence risk is there when a child with autism or adhd with adhd is born previously so environmental factors prenatal and parental factors we all know that high risk stillbirths and a bad obstetric history postnatal environmental malnutrition poor stimulation complementary feedings then breastfeeding is also a very very important factor associated genetic uh, problems are there the most common we know that fragile x now there is always another question is do we need to do genetic testing in every child who is labeled on diagnosis autism or not no the answer is no because we do not need to do genetic testing for each and every child we need to look into the genotype phenotype the genetic uh, phenotype of the child is he having dysmorphic features is there any association of the uh, genetic problems in the family is there any history of metabolic and etc then accordingly to look into that so that's a complete different uh, you know topic which we can have another one or two hours webinar on that so neuroanatomical basis of adhd so neuroanatomical basis of adhd says that all cortical points if we go about that the most important thing which they have mentioned is there is a delay in cortical maturation when we talk about the prefrontal cortex compared to the neurotypical child so uh, there has been found that uh, neuroimaging studies and mris has been done which have shown that there is a delay in cortical maturation of the prefrontal cortex when you compare at terms of neurotypical and a neurodiverse children and also there is delayed synaptic pruning when we talk about at the level of molecules in compared to the children who are neurotypical so this is the concept of synaptic pruning synaptic pruning is something which is present during the it starts at the as the child is born and peak of synaptic pruning generally happens at the age of 5 to 6 years where the unwanted neuronal connections and synaptic gets goes off and they get and this synaptic pruning is very very essential for our executive logical and higher mental complex commands to be followed so the most important understanding of our now is at the neurobiological level is in case of autism and case of adhd in case of autism there is under synaptic pruning that means if it if the pruning should happen at this 80% it is only happening at 50% level by the age of 3 to 4 years it is under it doesn't happen at a complete level whereas in adolescence whereas in case of adhd the synaptic pruning is delayed if it would happen at the age of 4 years it is happening at the age of 15 years or 12 years that is why we say that children who are on the autism they have poor prognosis compared to the child on adhd adhd children by the age of adolescence they will have better understanding better adaptation to the environment because they have a better prognosis it is all because of the delayed synaptic pruning synaptic pruning happens but it happens at later age whereas in autism synaptic pruning doesn't happen at all it is under so this is a very very important understanding now towards our concept why autism has poor compared to the adhd has better prognosis so this is a diagram of synaptic pruning now this synaptic pruning if i go into more into details synaptic pruning invariably happens because of the gut microbiota there is gut microbiota dis dysbiosis because of this gut microbiota dysbiosis to so the gba gut brain axis there is a imbalance between the good and the bad bacteria there is a cytokine cascade which happens because of these inflammatory cytokine cascade which happens it crosses the blood brain barrier and there it causes the functioning of the microglia cells which are known as the brain phagocytes and when it affects the microglial brain functioning cells it affects the synaptic pruning and uh, if we go into the more details at the cellular level these are mtor receptors are there which basically have been affected or under activated in children on autism and adhd so nowadays research are now been going on in terms of biomedical interventions where they are trying to modify bring about some natural cyticals or enzymes where they can improve the activity of mtor receptors so this is something at the level of research when it comes when it doesn't come we don't know so what is impact of functioning introduction to executive functioning adhd across the different life spans as i was telling you so executive functioning or cognitive process we comprise the seven skills whenever we talk about executive functioning executive functioning is something which is happening at the last stage so when i was talking to you about the previous webinar on socialization skills i have told you about sensory play i have told you about attention joint attention eye contact then socialization skills then it comes the high mental function or executive functioning and that is what executive functioning is that is a cognitive process which comprises of the seven skills self awareness inhibition 
नॉन वर्बल वर्किंग मेमोरी वर्बल वर्किंग मेमोरी इमोशनल सेल्फ इमोशनल रेगुलेशन सेल्फ मोटिवेशन प्लानिंग प्रॉब्लम सॉल्विंग एंड प्रॉब्लम विदाउट डिस्कसिंग एनीथिंग यू कैन इजिली फिगर इट आउट दैट दीज ऑल सेवन पिक्चर्स एंड स्किल्स आर टिपिकली लैकिंग इन चिल्ड्रन ऑन ए डी एच जी एंड इवन ऑन ऑटिज्म सो दैट इज हाउ द एग्जीक्यूटिव फंक्शनिंग इज बीन इम्पेयर इन अ चाइल्ड ऑन ऑटिज्म एंड ए डी एच डी बट सेट दैट the cause of executive functioning is very important whether it is falling on the adhd spectrum whether it is falling on autism spectrum whether it is falling on both the spectrum is very very important because at the end of the day the picture will be overlapping in both the cases but you need to rule out what is the root cause whether it is an adhd or autism because accordingly your approach your early intervention services your management towards that child will vary so executive functioning as i have told you now these are the different scales which i have been there prefrontal is the cerebral which is considered to the vent circuit which is responsible for giving response to vent questions now many a times if i go about into the executive functioning now i don't know whether you are dealing with these children but in my sessions i do also take sessions with children uh, uh, along with my therapist so we do learn about the concept of what questions now what questions is a very very big problem when we come into the concept of autistic children in teaching language they are not able to respond to what when and where questions now what they can respond but why is the most difficult question they have found it difficult to respond that is why logical thinking so when we are dealing on the language part on the children we need to under teach them the concept of wh questions what when and where so what when and where questions basically comes from your different areas of the brain so the what circuit is considered to the frontal basal ganglion network so when we are asking the what questions your frontal basal ganglia network gets stimulated so this is responsible for your planning goal setting which is lacking in children autism and adhd when we are coming to the when circuit that is when this is happen what when and where we do have flash cards in teaching children on them so the when circuit is coming from your prefrontal and the cerebellar network which is responsible for the time management then it comes why the most logical thinking frontal lobe to the limbic limbic is one of the system which is responsible for your emotional regulation now if i tell you more about this responsible for motivation now again you need to differentiate whether the child is having tantrums or it is sensory meltdowns can you differentiate and tell me that how can we differentiate between a tantrum and the sensory meltdown i give you an example for example there is a child who is on autism spectrum and he is going to the market and the mother he is very obsessed with the five cars he is very obsessed with the red car he is already having 10 to 50 10 to 12 cars at his home and he gets uh, totally show tantrums and everything he wants that red car because he has seen that mother doesn't give him he shows all sides of tantrum he goes into the tantrum state ultimately uh, the mother has to give him so when the mother gives him the red car purchase is the red car he continues to go into the crying he continues to cry and ultimately at the end of 2 to 3 hours ultimately he uh, gets comfortable stop crying and goes for a sleep so probably he has gone into the state of sensory meltdown why because whenever we talk about tantrums generally a tantrum is tangible it is tangible oriented that means it is towards a particular thing when the car is being given the child will suddenly get stop crying and it will be okay this is because the prefrontal area and the limbic area is interconnected limbic area is your area which is responsible for your emotions prefrontal area of the brain is the area which is responsible for giving you logical reasoning and understanding for example when the car was given to the child he stops crying until the car was not giving his limbic system was dominant i want car i want car i am crying i am crying so his emotional area of the brain is taking dominant over the prefrontal area when the car is being given to him the limbic system gets down the prefrontal area dominates and tells now it gets sends in the negative feedback now you stop crying you have given the car so control your emotions now be happy and logically you start moving with the parents so his brain the prefrontal area the brain which is responsible for planning logical reasoning starts activated so this typically happens in the tantrum child when it is coming to a sensory meltdown state when the child is on the autism spectrum the emotion the limbic area of the brain is always dominant it is always regulating his emotions i mean is it's dominant he keeps on crying he is not able to regulate emotions the prefrontal area of the brain which is responsible for logical thinking and planning even spite of getting the car he continues to cry because the limbic area has taken the over empowered and the prefrontal area of the brain cannot send the negative feedback to the uh, limbic system to stop your control your emotions this is typically happens in a child on autism spectrum or the children who are having poor emotional dysregulations so this is what we talk about the frontal limbic system which is responsible for the why circuit and regulation of the emotions 
Now the whose circuit is a frontal lobe to the cerebral area. So now how does executive function deficit present itself clinically? So this is the DSM-5 criteria that executive functioning, as I've told you, clinically it will present as making a lot of careless mistakes as we are discussing this. So these are all executive functionings which come. Now said that because I'm dealing here relatively in context to the ADHD, so the executive functioning clinically when it comes to the picture of ADHD will give you like this. But it doesn't mean it will be always present in ADHD child as I've told you this executive functioning is the end result which we are getting problems. Executive functioning deficit is the end result. But it can happen due to an autism also as an ADHD also or due to other reasons also combined. So natural history, when we go into the natural history, psychiatric comorbidities are more than 1% 170. Inattention persists in 60% of the cases. Hyperactivity, 70% chances might have remission. So 90% of the individuals with adult uh, childhood ADHD will continue to struggle with the residual functioning symptoms and impairment throughout the adulthood. But said that they generally get adapted to the environment due to X, Y, Z reason I've told you because the, uh, uh, I would say the, mm, the prognosis is much, much better compared to the children on autism. But yes, on long term, definitely they will have problems related to the anxiety and hyperactivity. So the impact of ADHD across the different lifespan, preschool, they have behavioral difficulties. So this is very, very important that how the ADHD phenotype presents in different lifespans. When you are diagnosing a child on ADHD during a preschool age, he will be mostly having behavioral difficulties. That is behavioral problems. When you diagnose an ADHD during the school age children, he will be having academic problems. He will be having behavioral issues. When you diagnose an ADHD in an adolescent age, they will be having problems with self-regulation, self-emotions, uh, and then anxiety problems, psychiatric comorbidities, sleeping issues, drug abuse, relationship problems, self-esteem, bullying, throwing out from the environment, uh, I mean from the jobs, not having too many friends, relationship maintaining, uh, divorce problems. So all these things do happen across a lifespan of ADHD depending upon in which lifespan the ADHD has been diagnosed and accordingly the consequences, the repercussions might happen as per those. So the phenotype is the phenotype of ADHD varies across the spectrum of the age. So comorbidities present in both the genders as I've told you 10 times it is uh, these are some of the facts. 10 times, more com 10 times more likely to have a positional different disorder and conduct disorder. A child who is having ADHD, the chances of having conduct disorder and a positional different disorder is 10 times more common, 3 times more likely to have anxiety and 5 times more likely to have depression. So these are some of the facts which has been taken from the literature. So 3, 5 and 10, 3 times more common have anxiety, 5 times more common have depression, 10 times more likely to have a positional different disorder. So ADHD evaluation, now I'll be going a little quickly on this. I think, uh, so we are already, 10.40 uh, is the 10.35 is the time. So I'll try to finish it off within uh, 11 maximum. So when you know, so we have discussed about the uh, phenotype, we have discussed about the clinical picture, we have discussed about the DSM-5 criteria, we have discussed about the comorbid pictures, we have discussed about the overlapping picture and executive function with autism and ADHD. So now we come out about the ADHD evaluation. So how can we make the diagnosis of an ADHD? Most important thing is assessment history taking. So history taking, I have told you what all things you need to look. Then next is very important is examinations. You look, so examination, see, uh, always remember whatever tools we are having, whether we are having Vanderbilt scale, whether we are having a, a Vanderbilt scale or a VHQ scale, or we are having cars or we are having DSM-5, or, uh, sorry, I mean uh, the tools, the CARS or ESA or EDOS or ASI, these are different tools are there for ADHD and autism. But said that these tools only help in supporting your observational skills. The diagnosis of autism and ADHD is purely, purely clinical. If you do not observe the child one or two times in your clinic and you directly put the tools on that child, you will never be able to come onto a true or a proper diagnosis because those tools are totally subjective. They are subject dependent. A person who has not used these tools at all in the last five to 10 times, he might not be able to use that tool first time on the first time on the children when he's looking at their ADHD child. 
Similarly, a child, a person who has not worked on these tools like cars and ESA and is applying it for the first time on a car with autism, child will not be able to come to a conclude diagnosis. So it is very, very important to observe the child first, look into the detailed clinical history and then use those tools because those tools will give you a supporting evidence to support your diagnosis. Those tools are not at all mandatory to label the child on autism and ADHD. These are just your supporting diagnosis. And the peculiarity and the good thing about DSM-5, it gives you the severity. Whether uh, If I talk about autism, it gives you whether it is mild, moderate or severe or level 1, level 2, level 3. So you can make a diagnosis of autism and ADHD just going by the DSM-5 criteria. No tools at all are mandatory. They are just to support your observational skills. And even if you use the tools, you should be very much thorough, well enough to work with those tools. Otherwise, they will be of no use. It will give you, one will give you a score of severe, one will give you a score of mild, other will not put you at all on autism. Or he might be not on autism, a child who is not, a person who is not well versed with the tools might label you as an autistic child. So that is very, very important to look into those things. Because even a child who is on GDD, global developmental delay, will have all these motor issues, will have all these uh, cognitive issues, will all, also have language social issues. And if you use a tool of cars on that child, he will label as you, you will put him on autism spectrum. Definitely because the tool, uh, the car score will definitely come in the uh, range of autism. But he's not an autistic child, he's a GDD child. So that is why your observation should closely correlate with your tools. So now coming to the ADHD, that is examination, general observations, behavior, mood, attention, fidgetiness, restless, impulsivity. That is all your observational skills. Observe the interaction of the parent and child. Observe how does he behave in your clinic, how does he respond, how is his way of writing, how about his focus and attention, how about his areas of interest. Then discuss more about the parents, about his school, discuss more about his hobbies, discuss more about his environmental, situational attentions and all those things, how many friends he have, discuss about the sleep problems and all these details. So academics, curriculum, writing, other assessment, physical examinations, dysmorphic, neurocutaneous markers, these are basically... Observe about his level of speaking, communication skills, complexity, how can he interact, what about his inferential skills, what about his reaction time, reasoning, maturity, funding, all those things need to be looked into consideration. So medical conditions, as I've told you, look into the sleep problems, seizure, enemy associated hearing problems. He might not be able to listen to you. Is he having a hearing problem? So you need to look whether we need to go for a beta testing or not. So putting all together, it is very important is what concerns this family the most. After discussing all these things, you need to now put in together what are the most important because the most important thing is you need to look into the concerns of the parent. That is more important. You are looking for the child just for 45 minutes and the parents are looking for the child 24-7. So in these cases, you need to put the parents' concerns on the top priority rather than putting your concerns at them and telling that, no, this is this or this is that. So they need to look into the what are the challenges, what are the problems the child is facing and XYZ reasons. So does the history, and um, now it is very important, does the history and examination suggest one of the following things? Are features of inattention and hyperactivity are present? Is the delays in two or more developmental domains, social communication difficulties, academic difficulties, psychological condition, or is there any possibility not mentioned above? So whenever you are taking into the detailed history, always put in your mind, label these four to five problems. Whatever have you asked and observed, are these pictures fitting into the features of inattention hyperactive? Are these features putting into the diagnosis GDD? Why I'm using this GDD? Because many a times autism, ADHD come onto an overlap problem when you are dealing with a child under the age of three to four years. As per the DSM-5, you cannot put a child as ADHD before the age of four years. But there is a term which is known as atypical ADHD when you can label a child as an ADHD before the age of four years. A GDD is a working diagnosis, a temporary diagnosis, which as per DSM-5 cannot be labeled beyond the age of five years. Only up till the age of five years, you can put as a GDD. But after five years, you have to remove this term as GDD. And this GDD goes, whether it goes into a autism, whether it goes into an ADHD, whether it goes into a speech language delay, whether it goes into an SCD, social communication disorder, you need to figure it out because after the age of five, you cannot use the term GDD. It is only a temporary or working diagnosis. So that is why the challenge comes here under the age group of two to four years, whether you are dealing with a true GDD, whether you are dealing with an ADHD, whether you are dealing with SCD, whether you are dealing with SLD, whether you are dealing with autism, because most of the phenotypic traits overlap with each other. That is why taking history is very, very important because if we use the tools in all these differential diagnoses, you will be definitely labeling a child as a false ASD or ADHD. 
So use of tools. That is why use of tools has come to the later stage. First most is your observation and history taking. So these are all different tools which are freely available. Vandenberg scale, which is freely available. Then in Klein scale, it is very, very time consuming. I generally don't use it. Use it cards or ESA. Snap view scale is another school which is freely available. Used between six to eight years, available in English. Then corner rating, which is again a well uh, diagnostic and rated scale. And but it is not freely available. Winterberg Brainerd and Teacher Rating Scale is truly available. I have also mentioned the link. You can go on to this and it is easily available. So these are all the rating scale. These are all uh, confirmatory diagnostic school tools for ADHD. So the most commonly which is used is Vanderbilt or Corner Rating Scale. Then Vanderbilt, it is easily available. It is online also available. You can just need to figure. You just go on to this link which I have given you marked as red. Just open it and put the scales and ask the parents the questions whenever and automatically the score of the Vanderbilt rating scale will come. Whether it is uh, predominantly inattentive, whether it is predominantly hyperactive, or it is combined. But I have told you in children, it is more of a predominantly hyperactive or impulsive. Then come the confirmation of diagnosis by DSM-5 because all your history taking and everything. So you need to look into that. These are the confirmation diagnosis of ABC. Are the significant symptoms of uh, inattentive hyperactivity present? Are the children is less than 12 years? More of six by nine criteria are present. Is it affecting his development leveling? It is affecting his uh, academic learning. It is present uh, till the age, or it is present in the last six months. Is the child is less than two years? It is present in two or more settings. It is very, very important. It should be present in two or more settings. If it satisfies all your answers, then the child fulfills the diagnostic criteria of a DSM-5. And are the symptoms not explained by any other condition? No, because if these symptoms are explained by any other condition, then probably you are not met. So if all these met criteria are met, you put the child as DSM-5, yes. So these were other diagnostic parameters which I was telling you, the 5 A, B, C, D. I've discussed about A, B is other symptoms present before the age of 12 years. Are the symptoms present in two or more settings? And are this affecting his impact functioning? So this is the crux of all the DSM-5. You can take a snapshot of this also. This is very, very important. All these criteria A to E should be met when you that we do not require a tool at all to put a diagnosis on a child on ADHD. Then comes the coexisting conditions like is the child is having sleep problem? Is there any oppositional defense disorder? Because I have told you 10 times more common oppositional defense disorder conduct disorder in children, three times more common anxiety and five times more common depression. Are there any associated overlapping problem like autism spectrum, specific learning, language disorders and ID? which is very invariably, uh, truly uh, invariably in a, as a thumb rule. Generally, ID is not at all present in children or not. Uh, ADHD, generally children on ADHD generally have a good IQ, but there is a concept of 25%. 25% children on autism have intellectual disability. 25% children on autism have sleeping issues, whereas the percentage of sleeping problems is much, much higher in children on ADHD. So identifying the coexisting medical problems, which I have told you, which might affect the sleeping problems, like sleep disorders, thyroid problems, hearing, vision, anemia. Whenever you put a child as an ASD or putting as a child an autism spectrum disorder, hearing is mandatory. All children with autism should go for a hearing testing, but all children with ADHD should not be going for a hearing testing unless and until you are suspicious about that. So uh, identifying the coexisting developmental medical problems, features of inattentiveness, hyperactivity with two or more domains, social communication issues, academic problems, psychological conditions, or any other mentions above. This is in relation to the hyperactive or impulsive behavior. So deciding on the nature of presentation, that is whether it is a predominantly attentive, whether it is predominantly hyperactive, whether it is combined or simple or complex means. Uh, simple means it is an uncompleted ADHD present in school between four to two years. Simple means there is no associated comorbid problem. That is, there is no other depression problems for I mean, gut problems, anemia problems, sleep problems, seizure problems, or autism, or speech language delay, or STD or ID. When you talk about complex ADHD, that is, you are making a diagnosis of children less than four years, as I was telling you. It's not like that. You cannot make a diagnosis of ADHD before four years. You can make it, but then it will become an atypical ADHD or complex ADHD. Having coexisting problems, that is, GDD, global development delay, or it is autism, or any other conditions. Whether it is how much affecting the impact on severity is affecting those things need to be looked into consideration. So this is how we now divide between simple ADHD and complex ADHD. So I have put across uh, two or three quizzes. If uh, you want, we can go into this. So uh, this is one question is a six year old male child 
with need based speech with average iq and mother complain uh, mother complains to the doctor that he is always fidgeting in class running pushing and disturbing other kids he always screams as soon as he enters the school gate this has increased over a period of time in school and mother is very very worried mother says he is the child is very cooperative with doing task at home doesn't show such behaviors at home what is the least likely condition associated with the child adhd behavior issues auditory sensory issues auditory processing auditory sensory issues and autism spectrum disorder so you can go through this question and uh, Yes, anybody who wants to respond to this? A six-year-old male child with a need-based speech with an average IQ. Mother complains to the doctor that is always fidgeting in class, running, pushing and disturbing other kids. He always screams as soon as he enters the school gate. This has increased over a period of time in school and mother is very worried. Mother says the child is very cooperative in doing tasks at home. Yes. So, see, uh, as per the DSM five, as I was going into the discussions, uh, the cri uh, the criteria of hyperactivity and impulsiveness is present definitely in this child, but it is it is situational. It is situational. It is very very important. This hyperactivity and this in inattentiveness is situational. It is happening only in the class, and it is not happening at the home. And as per DSM five, the features of hyperactivity and inattentiveness. should be present in two or more settings and there is one setting in the school and the setting is the home but in the home there are no such features so the diagnosis is least likely adhd yes i hope i have cleared myself in this so at one go it do appears to be adhd child but details of the question and details of the dsm 5 so this is what exactly practically we put the child as an adhd this is a typical practical example that whenever we come uh, invariably we put the child as an adhd so this is very very important to look into that that whenever we are making the uh, diagnosis we look into the diagnostic criteria for dsm 5 Yes, absolutely. The least likely diagnosis is ADHD. So there were again three four questions were also they have put across, but as time is not permitting, so I have taken this only one. Uh, question so uh, so to conclude is detailed history and examination are important for the diagnosis of adhd and to differentiate between hyperactivity true hyperactivity or an hyperactivity versus true adhd and use of tools to support information information from other designs so again as i was telling you your tools are only are supporting evidences they are not at all required to make a diagnosis so never depend upon the tools always depend on your clinical picture DSM five, your observational skills, your history taking, and history taking, as I have we always read during our MBBS time, that it is very very important. Henceforth, it is very very important, the most important history taking and your observational skills. Confirmation by DSM five. So please note, I have put up uh, take home messages. Confirmation is made by DSM five. It is not made by the tools. Look for co-occurring conditions, if any, and identify whether it is a simple or complex ADHD, and accordingly your early intervention strategies toward those child will accordingly help to improve them and give them a better life so i hope uh, though i think i was quite quick, uh, quick today because i need to complete the presentation within the given stipulated time and there are approximately 80 slides but i tried to jump more uh, important sli uh, unwanted slides and the least important slides and shared you the most important slides so thank you everyone thank you dr nitin and if there are any questions we can take across so what diagnosis will give a child who fulfills four or five out of nine adhd symptoms 
then in that case we will not put the child as an adhd we will might put as a child as an overactive or hyperactive child but definitely we will not put as an adhd link but generally this happens to be a very rare situation either the mother is not giving a complete history or the caregivers or the parents or we are missing if generally four or five criteria are met generally we are likely to be going on the adhd spectrum but we might not be able to get a clear history taking from the parents because it is very likely that uh, very unlikely that we are going into not going to an adhd diagnosis should we give it as a simple hyperactive impulsive that needs to be looked whether you are looking whether those criteria are fitting into the hyperactive type of adhd or whether they are fitting into the impulsive type of adhd see hyperactive or impulsive is now one in the same thing you can put we don't put it as an impulsive we put it as hyperactive oblique impulsive so go for an hyperactive adhd but in a dsm 5 they are using inattentive is the one criteria second is hyperactive oblique impulsive so hyperactive and impulsive is one in the same thing but generally we make a diagnosis we do not write as an impulsive child we write as an adhd attention deficit hyperactive child we do not write as an attention deficit impulsive child so i think uh, there are no more questions so dr nitin can we close up the session for today dr nitin hello i think he has gone for a sleep The, uh, how can we differentiate between ADHD and SCD? Because SCD can even have ADHD. See, the thing is, when we talk about SCD, SCD is social communication disorder. And it is a new diagnosis which has now been come under DSM-5, which was not there under DSM-4. And SCD, the most important thing which you need to look into that, uh, SCD, doesn't, SCD doesn't have a picture, SCD doesn't have a picture which is overlapping with ADHD. Uh, in the sense... In the sense, when I'm talking into the true labels of SCD, SCD will have social communication disorder. So the word itself suggests to you that the child is having social communication issues. That means to say they will be having a lot of uh, problems related to sensory. It is more of a sensory issues where the child is having. He will be having a lot of problems when he's not able to communicate in the social scenarios. The ch it is SCD is more of a typical diagnosis when I talk about differential diagnosis of a speech language delay. It is more a common correlate, give you a differential and more of a co overlapping picture with a uh, social, uh, with the speech language delay child because the picture is more or less overlapping with the speech language and a social communication disorder. But the difference between the two is in SCD child, he will not be able, be, he will not be comfortable in the social scenarios. He will give you a typical picture of pushing others. He will give you a typical picture of low anxiety, uh, low self-esteem, low confidence, always try to hug with the parents, not able to communicate in the environment. He will be a very good, he will be able to give you responses when it is comfortable at the home. But in social scenarios, he will show all sorts of sensory issues, fidgetiness, anxiety issues, not be able to sit at one place, not able to interact with the parents. If someone shouts at them, he immediately gets anxious. So those typical features of social anxiety will be present. Though he might be able to have a good receptive and understanding expressive, but those receptive and receptive understandings will typically go in vain when he's going into the social scenarios. Along with a lot of sensory issues, interoceptive issues are very common. They don't have a sense of how much food they have, how much food they want to fill or not. That is the sense of hunger and satiety and hunger uh, uh, states are very, very poor in them. Another thing is they have a lot of sensory issues. A typical, if you go into the sensory profiling of these teacher, picture, they will have definitely a lot of sensory issues but they don't have typical picture of ADHD, ASD or repetitive stereotypic behaviors, poor eye contact, no pointing, those things will not be there. But the typical features of sensory issues will be there, like tactile issues might be there. They might be issues related to brushing. They might be issues related to touch. All They might be issues related to interoceptive. So all those things will be there. Plus, these things will get more worse when they go into the social scenarios because as a result, their speech and effect might be affected. So this is a typical differential diagnosis in case of social, in case of speech language impairment or speech language delay. It is uh, generally SCD can be easily differentiated from ADHD, but it becomes difficult to differentiate SCD with a speech language delay. 
so uh, thank you uh, thank you everyone thank you dele uh, delegates for uh, bearing me in this uh, odd hours of the time so thank you everyone thank you dr nitin i think dr nitin you have gone for a sleep okay thank you